Join us for this week's On the Conservation Front as we dive deeper into critical water issues facing the state. Florida Sportsman has been leading the fight on the conservation front lines for over 50 years. The Florida Everglades is a unique watery wilderness. It is also vital to the very sustainability of South Florida's wildlife, its fisheries, and human population. Let's join Philip Cushlin, president of Friends of the Everglades, to discuss this unique but threatened ecosystem. Philip, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas founded Friends of the Everglades a half a century ago. What's the organization's mission? Well, the mission of Friends of the Everglades is to protect, to preserve, and to restore the only Everglades in the world. And so in 1969, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas started the organization to try to drum up grassroots support for this effort to stop the development of a jet port that was being built in what is now Everglades National Park. And she was successful with that effort. And uh, over the years and up to this date, we've sort of continued on that path uh, using grassroots advocacy to be involved with these Everglades issues. First and foremost has always been the issues of water quality, water management, and dealing with the problem of pollution from the agricultural industry. Describe the varied connected ecosystems that make up the Everglades. So you can think of basically the whole southern half of the state as one series of interconnected ecosystems. Starting up south of Orlando, you have uh, the Kissimmee watershed coming all the way down to Lake Okeechobee. And then you have the watersheds going out to the west and the east. And all of these watersheds are critical in terms of what's going to happen uh, further south in the more traditional sort of classic Everglades ecosystems. So uh, the pine rocklands, um, the tropical hardwood hammocks, uh, the big cypress, uh, of course the, the sawgrass, all of these ecosystems are dependent on what's happening to the north. And at the very southern end of the Everglades, uh, at sort of the interface of the freshwater and the ocean where you've got uh, the mangrove forests and the seagrass beds, um, which provide you know, the nurseries for the fish that, that go out to the offshore reefs, all of these are dependent on what's happening upstream. And so in a way, all of these ecosystems are interconnected. What's the key to removing nutrients at the headwaters of the Everglades to prevent toxic cyanobacteria blooms both in Laco and the artificially connected estuaries? In terms of Everglades restoration, we need to plan um, that these toxic algae outbreaks are going to continue to happen and we need to plan for what we're going to do to make sure that we don't have to discharge that water to the east and west coast and that we can clean enough water to send south and protect the Everglades. Further, what's the best course to take to get the water from the Everglades south into Florida Bay? You know, on paper, uh, it's a fairly simple solution. We just need to restore the sheet flow and have the water flowing south through these treatment marshes. Um, the problem is that we're working with a much smaller area of land than the traditional system had, and we're dealing with a lot more nutrients um, than would naturally be in the system. And so we're kind of handicapping ourselves in our ability to mimic the natural system. What are the major obstructions to restoring this sheet flow? One of the biggest obstructions was the Tamiami Trail, which was this highway that was built right across the middle of the Everglades. And so one of the, the good news stories has been the effort to raise the Tamiami Trail and allow that sheet flow to be restored. Um, but of course, the big problem we have is that all of the water flowing south of the lake is highly, highly managed, and we're just not doing a good enough job of managing it. Um, and the big problem we have is that we're prioritizing uh, the agricultural industry, making sure that they have enough water for their irrigation, making sure they can dump enough nutrients to grow their sugar, and that's really handicapping us in our ability to, to manage the water flow. Inshore and nearshore fishing is the reason many of us live here. It's the backbone of our tourism. If we lose the Everglades, do we lose that fishing? Some of the loudest and most influential voices in Everglades restoration are fishermen and fishing groups. And it's because the fishermen are the ones who are out there on the water and they see in a very direct way year to year the impacts of uh, some of these problems. So they see what happens when the toxic algae um, outbreaks are released to the shores and when salinity destroys the seagrass beds. And so yes, absolutely, Everglades restoration is critical to maintaining our recreational fishing industry. You know, most believe we have the science to restore the Everglades. Just, we just have a lack of political will. How do voters and citizens in general make their office holders accountable? I always like to say the two biggest things you can do are number one, become informed on the issue, and number two, let your representatives know that you care about this issue and that you're gonna hold them accountable. Um, these kinds of personal touches can have a really big impact in terms of, of making a difference. And of course, you can always find out more about these issues uh, by following Friends of the Everglades on our social media or by checking us out at everglades.org.